wanted to, I want to just take this big board and just walk up and down and fan everybody. <laughs> I, I, uh, I did notice, though, you can use your car, your tags. They work all right. So anyways, um, thank you, everybody, for being here. You know, it's always, it always feels a little bit vulnerable to get up and present. And I'm definitely feeling it today because have there not been some amazing sessions? I mean, there have been some really cool things that people have done. And so um, I hope to really do my best to add to that um, because... Really, there's things that we're doing well, and there's also things that we could be doing better. So what I'm going to hopefully do today is share. I want to just help you all out and maybe share some things that might be useful about our course development processes and some of the tools and things that we're using that I believe you could implement on your campus. And so um, before I get started, I would like to note that there is a badge in the Canvas community for taking a sneaky selfie with Kenneth Larson over here. He's our uh, developer, so if you look at hashtag sneaky selfies with Kenneth, you can see a few people who have been getting that badge here. And so Kenneth Larson is right over there. <laughs> oh, we do this just to make him blush because he's such a humble guy. <laughs> All right, so um, anyways. Okay. So I want to lead in with a little bit of context, and here, let me go full screen here. So I'm going to be talking mostly about our fully online course development process, although the further we go, the more this kind of is bleeding over into other course delivery methods. Um, but to give you a bit of context about who we are and what we do, we have about 500 fully online courses and growing. That was actually as of our last count. Which, have you ever tried to count up how many fully online courses you have? It's not as easy as you'd think it would be, is it? It's like, well, you know, this one ended and this one started. So we're usually at about 350 per term, roughly, that we're, we're rolling off um, at the beginning of the semester. And depending on the term, sometimes we're developing 20 courses. We've been up to developing 50 or so new courses uh, for a new term. But usually we're between about 20 and 40. And when we start to hit 40, we start to kind of pull the brakes back a little bit. Um, which is actually harder to do than you think it would be also, because people really want to go online. Um, and as far as our team goes at this point, we have three and a half instructional designers on Logan campus. And finding a spot for the half instructional designer is really kind of different, because you just chop a cubicle in half and sit them down. But um, bad joke. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, <laughs> but she, so she actually splits part of her time with another campus. So we have. Also, instructional designers who support other campuses um, as well. And so we have campuses around the state and, uh, and faculty who teach online, broadcast, face-to-face -face at each of those locations. And so uh, we've played around with blended, flipped, online. We've played around with four-week courses, seven-week courses, open entry, open exit courses. We do a lot of kind of playing around with these different models. So uh, we've also been developing online classes uh, at least 10 years that I'm aware of. Um, and so over time, uh, you know, we've kind of, it's been a process of evolution. And we've been bigger, we've been smaller, we've taken different approaches. But we've come across a number of needs and goals, and I don't think these are unique to us. And so I'm going to be sharing some of our approaches to how we've tried to um, meet some of these needs and goals. So one of them, I mentioned we have about 350 classes that go live by day one. Uh, or that, that go live every semester, and we really try to make sure that they are live by day one so that students show up and they log in and they see something and know that they're taking a course and that they have an instructor. Um, you'd think that this would be something that you wouldn't have to worry a whole lot about, <laughs> but it is a lot like herding cats. It really is. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't actually exempt myself from this because I was working on this presentation last night. Um, so teachers, uh, you know, everybody has a tendency to kind of procrastinate. So if we look at our online uh, course readiness, sometimes on the Friday before courses go live on Monday, um, this is probably sharing too much information. Sometimes it's not looking super good on Friday, but then somehow magically by Sunday night at 10 p.m. it's looking really good. And so, but we always try to, we want to keep, a, keep tabs on that and know where we stand so that we can go to sleep a little bit easier on Sunday night, knowing that we're going to wake up in the morning and our courses are going to be there. Um, 
Also, as we go, we, we want to try to, you know, we have a lot of different programs, a lot of different teachers. Um, we're a research one institution, so there's a lot of focus kind of on academic freedom. And, and actually, our faculty own, uh, we're one of the, we're a unique institution that our faculty actually own their online content. We don't keep the IP. There was something, a decision that was made back in the day to try to entice people to come teach online. And it's kind of a hard decision to reverse, even though we've kind of toyed around with the thought. But our faculty own their own IP. And so we want to be able to try to help them uh, do a good job, own their content, but also have a sort of baseline consistency as much as possible. And um, meanwhile, we also want to make sure we have good quality assurance. Uh, we want to make sure that we're meeting accessibility needs. We actually have a member of the um, National Federation for the Blind who does a lot of advising for the Department of Justice, and we want to make sure he's happy. Um, and so we, and, well, also we want to be accessible just because, right? It's the right thing to do. Um, and then we want to be able to also know how our course development is coming. How are those 40 courses doing? Um, are they going to be ready? Are the teachers coming along? Have they met with an instructional designer? Um, and be able to take snapshots of that. And uh, we want our instructional designers who have master's degrees in instructional design to be designing instruction. Ask yourselves, how many of your instructional designers spend their time designing instruction? versus clicking in Canvas or picking up the phone and answering and troubleshooting? That's a question that we asked ourselves. Are our instructional designers with master's degrees designing instruction and engaging faculty? Um, and then, of course, we want our, ha our faculty to be happy and productive. Their job isn't, they don't want to be clicking, spending all their time clicking around in Canvas and doing things that we can help them with. They need to be working on their uh, you know, quality teaching, also on their research and on their service and their job, their role responsibilities. So we want them to be happy, we want them to be productive, we want things to be as efficient as possible. So these are some of the needs that we try to address. Does this sound familiar? Anyone who's got a need that I don't have up here? Magic button? Yeah, you know what? One need we do have is a, is a crappy PowerPoint in, perfect course out tool. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, once we, if we ever get it, we'll share it. <laughs> okay, so what have we done? What's our supercharge? Here's some of the things we've tried, and I think some of you are already doing some of this. And so if you have ideas or if there's things you've seen that have worked, you're welcome to share. I really would love to hear some different input. So I'm just going to go through some of these and show some of the things we've done. So one of the things we started out with, one of the first things we did was get a course quality rubric. And it's gone through some evolution. Right now it's in version two. I really think it's ready for a version three, to be honest. But we really kind of started out by taking some of what we saw from, I think we took some from Chico State. We looked at kind of what Quality Matters was doing. We looked at Harrison Online College. We, were, we, looked, at, um, we looked at some of the works by Merrill and Gagne and these different ideas. And we kind of meshed it together and put together uh, a rubric that we figured we would have some pretty OK cross-rater reliability. And so I'll show you here what that looks like. So um, let me just go to the web here. So actually, we, uh, we use Qualtrics. We have this available in, in a PDF format as well. But we use Qualtrics in our instructional design team. We have uh, our instructional designers, um, as they go through and complete a course, they run it through this rubric. And then we usually try to get a second uh, designer to take a look at the same course and run it through the rubric as well. And this really is kind of like our baseline quality assurance. This, this rubric is content, isn't content specific. It's pretty content agnostic. Um, but it really tries to focus on some of those items that are typically important for a course. And so, uh, everything, you know, this isn't necessarily the best for statistical measurement because everything's just yes or no. But what we are trying to do is basically just say, okay, is, it, is the component in there or is it not? And then leave a lot of room down at the bottom for comments so that we can be able to measure and have a conversation with our faculty about their course. And so, yeah, here's one. We, we look at the assessments and activities 
Uh, course includes assessments and activities that are problem-centered or application-oriented in nature. Uh, each of these categories has a, has a weight. Um, each item within that category has a weight as well. Everything adds up to 100%. So it's not perfect. It really isn't. I don't want you to think it is. The more I go through it and use it, the more, I, you know, there are times when I go through it over and over and over and over again, and I think, man, we've really got to do a version 3.0. You know, there's some things here that I would improve. But it's a start, and it's something that we have that we can, we can stand up in front of faculty, and we do this in our trainings. We say, here's our course quality rubric. We hand it to our faculty when we get started. We say, this is what we're going to measure your course on. This is the baseline standard. This is a checklist for you. As you go through, we want to make sure that you're meeting all of these criteria. Um, and we'll help you do that. And, uh, and then it can also become a conversation piece later on as we go. We're going to some of our online programs that have been running for some time, and we're saying, yeah, it's been a while since these courses have been developed. Um, you know, they've been, this program has been running for five to eight, ten years. Um, it's time, you know, we've, we've got this rubric. We want to go through and just measure everything and, and then come to you with the results and just sit down and have a conversation about what we need to do if there's any courses that we need to, to look at redeveloping. And it's a great tool for that. Is anybody else using rubrics? Rolling your own or quality matters or what are you doing? Quality matters? Yeah. You know, we're, I, I, um, we've actually considered quality matters. Is it working out well? Do you like that? Yeah. 100%? No, they have to pass basically a threshold. So, yeah. Yeah. But we do have them meet, meet it to move forward. So, and to get paid and all that. So, um, at least for the ones that are, we're creating now, we haven't gone retroactive with that. There's some older ones that haven't run on that. So, there's some realities there. Um, that's done on new course developments, and we have used it to go and do some program evaluation. Oh, yes, and I'm being reminded to repeat the questions. So some of the questions I've just received are, um, are we requiring faculty to pass this to um, be able to uh, teach their course? To which the answer was, well, they need to, we have a threshold. Um, and uh, then the other question was, Oh yeah, is it used on new, just new, new courses? Yes, and old courses, we're going back and getting those when we have a chance. So another thing we've used uh, is we've got a, a course mapping tool that we share. Um, we have it available on Google Docs. We have it available on uh, just as a downloadable Word doc. We hand it out in paper version, whatever people are comfortable with. But it just is simple that helps people design their objectives, convert those into graded components, come up with a graded outline go through and turn that into uh, a weekly schedule, and then helps them do a little bit of uh, self-evaluation down here, making sure they've uh, thought about their students, et cetera. And so we use this as a tool to help faculty get started and thinking about their course. They can come in with their course map. We turn it over to one of our uh, student course developers, which we do have several. In a lot of cases, they build out the shell. Um, and it's also, it works really well having it on Google Docs because a lot of our faculty are distributed. And so we're able to talk on the phone. And I, I think my record is three hours on the phone with somebody going through on a Google Doc. And so that was good times. Um, <laughs> so uh, we're getting to the cool stuff. But one of the things that's really been useful, does anyone use a project management system to kind of keep track? What are you using? Basecamp? Smart sheets, smart sheets, assign, Asana, Asana. Okay, did I say that right? Okay, um, I've heard of it. I've seen it. What we're using is um, Podio. Have you ever heard of Podio? It's kind of fun. So, and this is the one that I forgot to just log into. But let's see if it remembers me. No. Okay. So, um, what we liked about Podio is that it's, well, it's free to us. They kind of grandfathered in their institutions uh, so we can add people to it. And then um, I'm not sure if it would be free to somebody who hadn't started on it earlier. But, uh, but then we can basically build our own 
uh, forms in here pretty easily. So we have um, all of our courses in here, and if I go down and look at all of our courses that are starting this coming fall, for example, here's, here's our designers, um, here's the courses that they're working with, and if I you know, happen to click on one, so some of these are interns, uh, if I happen to click on one, um, I can see here, these are custom fields that we've set up, but they can, set, you know, they can check their overall progress, add comments, we can respond to those, um, and you know, we can mark when it's done, where it, what kind of format it's in. It's a really handy tool, and then we're also able to link in other things, like we, we uh, track our, we, we fill out our rubrics, but then we go and track them uh, on here as well, so we'll, um, and then we can have little, uh, you know, at, we can have little metrics over here on the side that help us, and so it's a great tool for just being able to organize a team around. We do it on Qualtrics, and then we just take the, the or so the question is, you're saying you're, um, Survey is, all Qualtrics is integrated with Podio. What we do is we complete the survey, we have the, um, just the results, we have a link, we just copy that link, go into Podio and paste it. Now when we do that, it kind of recognizes, hey, that's a Qualtrics link, and then it puts the little logo down there, and then we click it, and so, and then we'll, we'll usually enter the score too, and we can kind of. We can. You can actually add. Uh, okay, the question is, yep. Do, do, we, do we have our faculty use Podio to contribute? Uh, we can. So we can, add, um, we can add outside users as participants, and then they can upload files, and, we can, and then they see progress as it's updated. So uh, some faculty are fine with that, and some are kind of like, what is this? I don't want to deal with that. But do we, we don't make them do it, no. So we, it's mostly internal, so. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so then the other part that gets really fun is when we started to say, okay, how do we wanna standardize this? How do we wanna help our tool, our designers design? How do we wanna, how do we wanna, um, you know, really kinda help our faculty, you know, make this, make this easier for them, and so uh, we, decided, you know, we were using templates. We were, um, ha we had templates that we just created that were basically course shells sitting off somewhere in a sub account. And so when someone would teach online, we'd say, okay, uh, we've got a template, we're gonna go out, we're gonna copy it in, and it'd have some basic stuff, and then we'd go in and delete out the stuff that we didn't need. And sometimes you'd see somebody send a course out that had the template thing that they accidentally didn't remove or we didn't remove or something. Um, and then you get this thing where somebody would design a course that was kind of different for another group, and so they'd have a template, and then you'd have somebody come up with something else that's cool, and so we had like five or so of these templates, and there's a lot of confusion in our design team as to which one's the template that we want to use, and it was really getting a little bit hard to manage. So we convened this little template committee, right, that's what we do in a... Uh, university setting, we convened committees, but while we were there, uh, we had Kenneth Larson, who had actually just recently discovered uh, for another project that we were working on, how to uh, kind of hack into the rich text editor, and how to hack into the, the uh, well, how to use LTI to be able to um, get into the um, process of creating pages and things like that, and he said, well, why do we have to have a course that we're copying in? Why can't we just have this be something that can be custom built. And so that's where the design tools began, Kenneth Ware and that sort of thing. That, in fact, here you go, here's my shirt. Shameless plug, designtools.usu.edu if you want to learn a little bit more. And uh, there's a survey if you want to fill it out. Um, so uh, we, uh, yeah, let me pull that up. So here in, uh, with our design tools, uh, we can start to do things like use templates that look Interesting, so here's a course, it's, it's not a huge course, but you know, we're, um, it's using features to pull the modules in onto the home page and do some things that we've wanted to do all along. 
Um, it's got the ability then within each of the pages to have template pages that get repeated and that have a certain consistent theme. And it's all doable by, uh, whoops, by just coming and activating uh, an LTI tool for our template wizard. It's visible only to faculty. And then they can start out by creating their page templates. Um, I'll just create a primary page template. They can launch their design tools and go ahead and start to build in themes. So um, now you see why you want sneaky selfies with Kenneth. Um, <laughs> and then you can start to add in different template, you know, different sections here. And uh, you can pretty quickly start to build a course. So, you know, I can tell you from experience that what, you know, where we used to sit down with an instructor and say, okay, let's talk about your course, write it down, say, okay, we'll get back to you in a week or two. Now we're sitting down with instructors and we're saying, let's talk about your course. We're pulling this up and we're building their course while we're talking about it. We're building out the shell. They leave and we have a course shell for them. And they have uh, assignments and content and an interesting looking homepage and all of that as they're leaving. And, you know, we do this in the amount of time that it used to take us. I mean, it would take a trained designer to put together something like, you know, this, I don't know, half a day, a day, especially if they're using custom CSS or trying to hack in JavaScript to figure out how to do this sort of thing. Um, and so, it's really just cut our time in developing in half uh, or, or more. I mean, we can do some, sometimes we can crank out a course shell in 10, 20 minutes if we need to, like before we, we go home um, after we've answered the emails. And so this part has really supercharged our design process and really helped to add um, some, some uh, consistency into our course design. We've made this available to teachers as well. So teachers can use it. And we've seen some abuses, we really have. But for the most part, teachers handle it pretty well. So, um, okay, so that has been just a huge bonus, a huge benefit to us. And this is available. Um, there, is, there are, if you go to designtools.usu.edu, in fact, here we go, designtools.usu.edu, you can find some information about that. Uh, you can find, um, we, we do have a version of this on open source. Uh, that version will probably not be as effective after the UI change, but we are anticipating the UI change. Um, and we're looking at options as to how we're going to make this sustainable uh, and to be able to have it be shared for more people. And so um, keep in touch. You can watch this site and get updates, and you can respond to our survey if you're interested. In seeing where that goes. So um, some other things we've done, now, now that we have these tools, we're able to kind of move more quickly. Uh, we've had some really, um, we've done some fun things. We have a really good group of people. We have uh, instructional designers who we have that, um, you know, are just getting started as instructional designers, but they're still very talented. Um, they're helping and starting out with answering um, our phones and helping out with a lot of the tech support for about half of uh, their time, half of the day, but then the other half of the day they're teamed up with a more advanced instructional designer and they're working as teams on courses and so we've got some really good brain trust and we've got this team, uh, this team effort and we're also able to, they're also able to um, organize their workload and, and hand it off to some of our student workers and we've been able to kind of manage to find a structure in terms of our organization where we have kind of a a mentorship model where senior instructional designers are doing more design, uh, more organizing of consultations with faculty, handling some of the escalations. Uh, we have newer instructional designers who are being mentored, who are helping with a lot of the support, but who are um, also contributing and taking part in the design and in the course building. Uh, and then a, uh, a student hourly worker structure that's helping to to really offload and help us respond when things get big or small as far as our load goes. Um, okay, sorry, didn't mean to scroll away from there. Uh, some other fun stuff. This is another 
thing that I thank Kenneth for all the time. So uh, we have our tracking tool. So I, before, before um, we did this in Canvas, I would spend probably half a day or more just in, in, um, in Excel or on Google Spreadsheets pulling down the Canvas provisioning data, pulling down data out of Banner, trying to just get a, re a spreadsheet list of all of our fully online courses so with contact information for our faculty and that way we could go through and we could start to measure the status of each of our online courses. And uh, you know, this was, this was a painful process but it was worth it and we'd just be able to keep this up to date. We'd all go into this Google spreadsheet and we'd watch it. Well, uh, we were able to work with Kenneth to, and he was able to say, hey look, you know, we can automate a lot of that. You can go just pull in that banner data, plug it in, and then we have a database that we can keep updating. You just go in, refresh your data with data from Canvas. So I can come in here to this admin screen and I can say, okay, I'm just gonna go in and I'm gonna update all of the published dates, or all of the published statuses of these courses, and also check to see if there are assignment pages or teacher activity. And so what this does is you can get an at-a-glance view of where, where the courses you want to watch are at. And you can filter by instructional designer, you can filter by course, and we'll usually just kind of divvy this out and say, okay, go. And so you can see here, these, are, these white ones are courses that are active. So this one, um, there's an, uh, this link to the course works great. This one's published. It has uh, course settings that have been set. It has a course syllabus. It has users. Um, it has assignments. And it has pages. And so at a glance, I can go down here and I can see, okay, this particular course, which actually isn't using Canvas because it's like an internship course or something, doesn't have anything, but I can see that at a glance. Um, I can look and I can add comments. And uh, if I hover over, if I see a comment, I can hover over it and I can see information about that course. And so we're able to just go in and continue to refresh that data as we get closer to the semester and look and see the status of our courses. And this is just using the Canvas API and then data that we're pulling in. So, are there any questions at this point about this? So we have actually a database. We have a, as instructional designers that oversee certain programs. And so our database is just pre-populated with that information, who, who those instructional designers are. And then of course there are exceptions to that rule. Maybe there's a teacher that teaches for this program and also for this program, or, or is it one of the regional campuses? And so they aren't necessarily working with that designer who works with that program. So we've, so we've built into this uh, the ability to change your designer if we need to. So, so anybody can go in, they can hit this this uh, button here and they can assign it to, you know, assign this to me or they can click and, and, or I can go through and pick who I think needs to actually work with that person. And then what's also nice about this is we, we can take a kind of a reporting view of it and say, okay, what's, where do we stand? Um, this is using high charts here. So you can see these are the courses that are ready. These are the ones that are starting later. Actually, there was a lot, this is summer, so there's a lot of weird ones that aren't applicable, but then we can look and see, okay, how balanced are we? How many are different people watching? And just take a look and make sure that we're balancing our load. So, super handy. Um, other reporting tools we've used too. Uh, we've got, um, oh, I thought I had this one open, so let's see. Um, I'll just pull it up on the slide. Uh, reporting, so here's, Here's a syllabus tracker. So later on in the semester, this gets interesting. If we want to look and see um, how many courses have syllabi in Canvas. Uh, and then you can look and see by program. There's, a, there's the course. I can click on that link and it'll pull up the syllabus. If it's a file, I can click and download it. So um, one thing that was a Yep, the question was, even if there's a file posted, it'll connect, it'll download the file. Yes, it will. So uh, what's kind of fun about this, too, is you can say, okay, I want to drill this down to a department. 
Um, so our psych this was a request from our psychology department. They said, we want to be able to, we need to show all of our syllabi on our website. Can we somehow break this down? And so we can do a, just open a direct link to their course syllabus list, and this only pulls the active syllabi. They can take that link, put that on their website, and say, view our syllabi. And there it is. So there's the syllabus, there you guys can see it just downloaded. So, um, Handy too, I've got one that helps us provisioning our proctored exams as well, that checks to see how many courses have access restrictions and that sort of thing. So these are all tools that are just available using the Canvas API. So. So this is actually, it's actually using a developer token, or the, the uh, question was, is this something that has to be set up at the admin level? This is actually a report that's running outside of Canvas using a developer token. So. It's a, it's a, so the question is, so whoever you set that up um, would be able to run those reports. It's actually just an open website. Uh, you can go there, you can run the reports, it's all open. So. Um, I am running right up to the time limit. So um, we have another session tomorrow where we'll be talking about analytics. We've been working on the um, analytics beast. We've been pulling down user um, access reports since fall and running those through an ETL process and putting them in a database. And now we're using the, the Canvas data as a pilot. So we've got some cool reports there to help us inform our design process and check our design decisions. And then a little note here for captioning. We have access to Caption Sync and we just push our videos through there and then we get captions back quickly. But let me just go to our last slide here since we are out of time. And here's contact information and that website again, our website. If you're interested in more information, we're happy to continue to talk about this um, outside of the room or offline or whatever. Thank you. Appreciate you all coming today.